Hi, I'm David Edmonds of the BBC World Service and this is The Big Idea. I found the most fascinating ideas around and the people who thought them up and I'm going to do my best to explain them. Today's big idea is wanting the same as liking. Back in 1970, an experiment, a shameful experiment, was performed on a New Orleans psychiatric patient. We know him only as patient B-19. B-19 was unhappy. He had a drug problem. He'd been expelled from the military for, quote, homosexual tendencies. As part of his therapy, and as an attempt to, quote marks again, cure him of being gay, his psychiatrist Robert Heath hooked electrodes into his brain. These electrodes were attached to what, at the time, were thought to be the brain's pleasure centres. B-19 was given a, a little box with a button in it attached to a wire that would lead up to his electrode, and he could turn on his own electrode by pressing the button. B-19 did do that. He would turn it on, he would press the button thousands of times. In a three-hour session, he would press perhaps a thousand times an hour to get many stimulations. Meet Kent Berridge, a neuroscientist from the University of Michigan. The electrode stimulation, he explains, had a strange impact on B-19. It made him feel very, very sexually aroused, a compulsion to engage in sex acts of whatever kind he could at that moment, and a compulsion to find all kinds of things sexually arousing, even if he wouldn't have found them sexually arousing before. But there was a second surprising aspect of B-19's behaviour. When the psychiatrist asked him about how the electrode made him feel, he expected a response like, Wow, that's fantastic, delightful, the most wonderful sensation I've ever had. But that's not what he said, as we'll hear in a few minutes. For many years, psychologists and neuroscientists thought that there was no real difference between liking something and wanting it. Wanting and liking absolutely sound like two words for the same thing. We often use them interchangeably. If we want something, it's because we like it. If we like it, it's natural that we'd want it. You like chocolate, so you want chocolate. Until relatively recently, it was assumed that the chemical, the hormone, driving our pleasure sensations was dopamine. The evidence for this seemed overwhelming. For example, in one experiment, scientists removed dopamine from rats' brains. The result? Rats wouldn't pursue sugars anymore. They wouldn't pursue cocaine or drugs of abuse anymore. They wouldn't pursue social rewards with other rats. They wouldn't be interested in any of the rewards in life. The assumption was, cut off the dopamine and you cut off the pleasure. We know when a baby likes something because of its facial expression. The same is true of orangutans. Even rats, who are omnivores like humans, they like sweet foods, they like fatty foods, they don't like bitter foods. They have facial reactions, lip licking to sweetness and gaping and head shaking to bitterness. That shows us they like the one and find the other disgusting. Just like humans, rats take pleasure in sugary substances. To test whether he could stop rats liking sugar, Kent Berridge deprived them of dopamine. Sure enough, they ceased to want food. They ceased to approach it. But then, the rats were physically fed the sugar substance. And to our surprise, the rats still liked the taste absolutely normally. The pleasure was still there. Another experiment increased dopamine in rats, leading to a huge increase in eating, eight times that of a normal rat, yet no increase in liking. So, here was Kent Berridge's hypothesis. Was it at least conceivable that our dopamine system isn't about liking at all? It's about wanting. It was a theory that in the beginning, even Kent Berridge didn't really believe. And certainly, Nobody else did. We met a lot of scepticism. Now, there's a new scientific consensus. Dopamine doesn't increase liking, it increases temptation. If you're hungry, dopamine will intensify the temptation for food. If you're a smoker, it can make you crave a cigarette. In evolutionary terms, 
wanting is more fundamental than liking. To survive, you need to want food, to want to have sex and reproduce. Whether you like this stuff is, really, less important. A creature with a wanting system could survive and thrive and propagate its genes. A creature with only a liking system might not. The most startling evidence that the dopamine system drives wanting, not liking, comes from a recent experiment. Kent Berridge attached a little metal stick to the rat cage. Touch the stick and it delivers a minor electric shock. An ordinary rat may touch this rod, this stick that sticks out into the, the cage once. Maybe it will touch twice. It will get the electric shock and then it will stay as far away as it could from that thing. And it may even kick sand towards this object, this rod, to try to bury it. It's a defensive, a naturally evolved defensive reaction to try to bury this nasty object. That's a normal rat. Kent Berridge wondered whether he could produce abnormal rat behaviour. Via another part of the brain, the amygdala, Berridge and his team turned on the rat dopamine system whenever the rodents approached the rod. Amazingly, the rod then becomes an object of fascination. This rat comes back to the rod. It sniffs it eagerly, it approaches it, it sort of hovers over it. It seems very excited and interested in the rod. It gets closer and closer, it sniffs it, it then it touches it with its paw again or with its nose and it does it again comes back it's as though it's just irresistibly fascinated and attracted by this rod that shocks it and it cannot resist coming back in the course of five or ten minutes it'll come back five times at least and get five shocks and then we stop the experiment after it's had five or at maximum ten because we don't want it to shock itself too much the single most important implication of the wanting-liking distinction is the insight it offers into addiction, be it to drugs, gambling, perhaps even to food. For the drug addict, wanting becomes detached from liking. It isn't the case necessarily that they like their drugs more than another person who takes the same drug but isn't addicted to the drug. It is the case that they want it, often triggered by cues, especially exacerbated in moments of stress. The dopamine system operates through cues. It learns that certain cues bring rewards. For the drug addict, the cues could be the paraphernalia and the taking of the drug, the syringe, the spoon for heating up the cocaine or the heroin, the sight of things that are associated with the drug, being on the street corner where we buy the drugs, being in a party where we take the drugs. These are cues that can trigger the wants. For some individuals, the dopamine system becomes sensitised. That is to say, the wanting never goes away, even if the addict ceases to use drugs or alcohol. Other drug qualities do go away. Tolerance to the drug will go away. Withdrawal symptoms, if the drug is heroin or alcohol, something that produces a withdrawal syndrome, that will go away after you've stopped taking the drug. But sensitization of the dopamine system doesn't go away. In rats, we know that this sensitization can last half a lifetime. The task now for researchers is to find whether they can reverse it in rats and ultimately, hopefully, in humans. Remember patient B19. He'd been hooked up to a so-called pleasure electrode and kept pressing the button to activate it. Why did B19 not express delight in the resulting sensations? Perhaps, the psychiatrist mused, it was because he was no good at expressing his feelings. But now we have a more convincing explanation. They were turning on wanting for rewards, wanting to get the electrode again, wanting for sex or for food or for other things, turning on the wants, but not turning on liking. So the question arises, did B19 ever really have a pleasure electrode? Or did he have an electrode that made him want? Want sex, want the button, but not necessarily like any of these anymore. Well, that's it for this edition of The Big Idea on the BBC World Service. I'm David Edmonds. The producer was Robbie Wojciechowski. If you would like, or indeed want, to listen to more editions of The Big Idea, go to bbcworldservice.com. Thanks for downloading The Big Idea. It was mixed by James Beard. 
If you've enjoyed this and others in the series, please leave a rating or comment if your podcast provider allows this. You can even let me know on Twitter at David Edmonds 100 about the big ideas you think I should be listening to. This is a BBC Radio Current Affairs production for the BBC World Service. I like that. I don't think I like that. This is the sound of crowd science. Those very alarming sounds around. It's quite normal. This is what women want. They want a man that can eat a stick. I have a brilliant trowel. Um, That's tiny. (laughs) What you should see now is a cloud. No way. Each week, the Crowd Science Podcast answers your questions about life, Earth and the universe. Are there foreseeable limits to knowledge? It's an excellent question. Actually, it's a very deep question. With the help of scientists around the world who are trying to find new answers themselves. We think that people have a little more control over their brainwaves than they think they do. That's Crowd Science from the BBC World Service. We smash things together and we'll see what happens. Just search for Crowd Science wherever you get your podcasts. You've got brain freeze. <laughs>